Good morning. Buckle up. It's going to be a busy one. The budget and a bust up at the BBC. A couple of days to go. Not until Gary Lineker and the BBC make peace. An epic spat over politics, impartiality and the public's favourite game. We are working very hard um, to resolve the situation and make sure that we get output back on air. The BBC is not acting impartially by caving in to Tory MPs who are complaining about Gary Lineker. But until the budget, the calm down Chancellor will be on his feet on Wednesday with a vow to get the country back to work. We think that we have the chance to be one of the fastest growing countries in Europe. Politicians agree the way we make our living isn't good enough. Growth's been measly. But the government and Labour don't agree on the fix. We have one big question this morning. Not whether the BBC and its biggest star can kiss and make up, but whether politicians can find ways to show the economy is live and kicking. And the Chancellor is with us as he puts his finishing touches to his first budget. Hoping to step into the Chancellor's shoes at the next election, Labour's Rachel Reeves will join us too. Mark Thompson was no stranger to crises in his years as Director General here at the BBC. What does he reckon is the way out of this latest storm? And with me to chew it over at the desk, Simon Clark, the Tory MP who wants tax cuts now. Nadia Whittam from Labour, the UK's youngest MP, and the TV executive Peter Salmon, who at the BBC used to be Gary Lineker's boss. Welcome. We're going to keep you busy this morning because it's the budget on Wednesday. Now, that is a critical moment, especially when the economy is only really wobbling along. But take a look at this lot. The front page is only really one lead story in town. It's Gary Lineker there on the front of the Sunday Times. Lineker chaos piles pressure on BBC chief. Sunday Telegraph, I won't quit, says BBC boss Tim Davey. On the front of the tabloids, the Sunday Express, BBC Sport, Blackout, the Sunday Mirror, Gary Lineker, I will never be silenced. Now, you might be watching this programme after viewing an unusual version of Match of the Day without its normal presenter, or indeed any presenter, a pundit's revolt after Gary Lineker was suspended for posting tweets critical of the government's immigration policy. It's clear Tim Davey wants him back, but can this mighty mess be resolved? Now, Peter, you are one of the few people who work closely with Gary Lineker. You are his boss. What do you think would be going on in his mind? What's he up to? Ah, uh, it's, a, it's a mess, isn't it? He, he, they must be wishing they could you know, reel this back 72 hours and, and start it all over again. It's, a, you know, it's Oscars Day, but there's no prizes, I think, no awards for how this has been managed. And it shows how things are, have to be managed very quickly, very proactively, up front, on fast-moving stories, you know, particularly, particularly ones with political dimensions to them. So I think, it's, um, I think they've got to take action and pretty quickly. It doesn't, it doesn't help. The chairman of the BBC himself is he's slightly to one side in this process and there's a bit of an issue. Yeah. It means that Tim Davey is sort of isolated in some ways. He needs to come home and grip this now. We need him back uh, running the ship. So, so what, it's a tricky one. What do you think they got wrong, though? You hinted there at basically it's just been too slow. They should have nipped it, this mess yeah. in the bud before it went out of control. Well, I think there's a few things. One is I think the guidelines are a bit opaque. Um, they about what people can them. and can't say in what their What people can and can't yeah. say, who can say this, who can say that, freelancers versus staff, major figures versus minor figures, all the rest of it. It, it is complex. You can see why you do it, because it gives you a sort of get out mm. in some ways for every situation. But equally, times like it can feel like it's a bit heavy handed. Um, I think also, uh, you know, these are fast moving stories. You, you've got to have figured out what you want to do up front mm. and get on with it and do it and work out what your end game is. And now the mm. story and the situation has got away from them. And just briefly, what do you think Gary Lineker actually has been trying to achieve with all of this? Because he has got into trouble over this kind of yeah. thing before and then not stopped himself. Where's it's, his responsibility? It's, well, it's complex, isn't he? He's a, he's a major figure now. He's yeah. he, 25 years in match of the day. He's, he's more than just a TV presenter. He's a national figure. Uh, he's got views. He's got passions. He's been involved in the looking after Ukrainian refugees. Uh, it may be that Gary's outgrown the job and the role in the BBC. There, might, there is a moment, you know, 25 years in, mm. before that was Des Lynham. Gary took over. He's been brilliant. 
sometimes there's a point at which you cross the line and your ambitions become such that you... So maybe he's on the way to the it, door. It might, that's that's might very be. interesting. Yep. Now, of course, this has you know, created this huge standoff between Gary Lineker and the BBC, but it has also got politicians absolutely on high alert, high drama. Simon, mm. why does it matter to some people in your party so much what a sports mm. presenter is saying online? Mm. Well, I disagree very profoundly with what Gary Linick has said. I think that uh, comparisons to the 1930s as he's uh, made are, are deeply inappropriate and actually very tasteless. Uh, it is a very difficult issue. And I think, as, as Peter says, that there is an element whereby the BBC needs to resolve some of the ambiguities about the relationship between... But why does it matter to MPs what a sports presenter is saying? Well, why does it get so conservative so wound up? Mr Lineker has a huge reach and, you know, the, uh, the reality is that he is obviously operating on a publicly funded broadcaster. He is someone whose platform largely derives from his role at the BBC. Mm -hmm. He's saying things which are sharply partisan and I think which are also deeply unfair and certainly I think the majority of people watching this programme, I think, would accept that we have a legitimate right to control but, our borders. But wouldn't you also, as a Conservative, stand up for free speech? Yes, I would. And actually, I think this, this whole situation is, a, uh, is, is fundamentally a mess, and it's one where the BBC needs to resolve this ambiguity. I don't like cancel culture of any kind. Mm. I don't like to see people being taken off air. I think there is a... Uh, there is a slight irony here and a slight hypocrisy because obviously I wonder how many of the same people calling for Gary Lineker to be restored were calling for Jeremy Clarkson a few weeks ago well, to you, be removed. Well, you used the word hypocrisy there. Nadia, I know on, 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 on Twitter actually you said there was something about hypocrisy about this row. What did you mean by that? Well, I think firstly Gary Lineker was right to call out the government's bill. And I think, yes, he works for the BBC, and it's important that the BBC is impartial. But as you say, he's a sports presenter, not a news presenter. And if we're going to talk about impartiality, let's talk about the fact that the BBC chairman donated £400,000 to the Conservative Party and arranged an £800,000 loan to Boris Johnson. But what I, I think we mustn't be distracted by is from the bill itself. Um, which is what Gary Lineker was drawing attention to, because the government is trying to play divide and rule, pure and simple, by criminalising asylum seekers and in the process risking breaking international law. But some people in your party say actually what he said to make a comparison with 1930s Germany, Yvette Cooper said actually he was wrong to do that. So some people even in your own party think he overstepped the mark. I think um, the point that he was making was about the cruelty of this bill. I mean, uh, when, when you think about the kind of wider picture with the government, you'd have thought, wouldn't you, that they'd have learned not to, not to have picked fights with footballers after Marcus Rashford forced them to U-turn on free school meals, and now this with Gary Lineker, and now we're all talking about the government's cruel asylum policy. Well, I know that Simon, you were shaking your head at some of that, but we'll get back to you guys later. There have been lots of people picking different fights with different people in the last 48 hours. Now, the boss of the BBC, Tim Davey, is under pressure to resolve all of this. Here's what he had to say yesterday. This has been a tough time for the BBC, and we care about our audiences. We want to get the right um, outcome for this. We're working very hard to get that done. And I would like to see Gary Lineker return on air. So how will the BBC climb out of what does feel like a crisis with popular programmes not properly on air? Who better to ask than a man who sat in the director general's chair? Mark Thompson, who had the hot seat during the storm over a trailer that misrepresented the Queen. Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross's prank calls, remember them? And horror of horrors, a fake competition at Blue Peter. Now that might feel like small beer compared to the hyperspeed and hyperbole of the 2020s. Or is it? Mark Thompson is here and he went on to run the New York Times and turn that into a huge digital brand. And you now are the chair of AnnStressStreet.com, yeah. which also is a huge online business. Um, welcome to you. How has the organisation found itself in this mess? I mean, this seems completely out of control. Most importantly, popular programmes are not on air properly. So the audience is losing out. Do you think the BBC looks like it knows what it's doing? Well, let's... You know, calmness, proportion. We've lost a couple of, of sports programmes so far, which is obviously disappointing for Match of the Day fans who've got a much truncated version of Match of the Day. Um, but walking into the BBC this morning, it, it's, it's a, you know, for a place which is meant to be in complete crisis, is its usual rather boring, solid set self. And I think 
I believe that viewers and listeners should believe that the BBC is going to be here. And frankly, people will have forgotten about this in a few weeks or months, certainly years. So it, 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 is, it is what it is, which is an argument about actually quite a difficult area, mm. which is, is what are the bounds of what it's reasonable for very, very big BBC stars to say? Is it okay for them to insert themselves kind of full force into, an, into a very controversial news cycle? Mm -hmm. um, it's easy with news. Mm -hmm. If, you, if you, you, Laura Koonsberg, had put out this tweet, mm -hmm. The Monty Python big foot would come down immediately and splat, and that would be yeah, that. I'd be and, out of the building within a couple of minutes. And rightly so. But, 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 but what but is in the these right cases, and wrong here then? Well, there's a, I mean, it's interesting. Greg Dyke, former director general, yesterday was saying that the, the, these guidelines, the, the rules on impartiality, apply only to news and current affairs. Not if you read them. Not if you read them. Here's a paragraph. There are also others who are not journalists or involved in factual programmes who nevertheless have an additional responsibility to the BBC because of their profile at the BBC. We expect these individuals to avoid taking sides on party political issues or political controversies and to take care when addressing public policy issues. So, so the, that's the guideline. That's quite a new... It's after Greg and my time, but so, that's a new guideline. And, and under that guideline, then, in your view, is it clear that Gary Lineker was over the mark as one of those high-profile figures? So, so this is figures? the interesting thing. I would say, firstly, and I've obviously not been involved in it at all, I would say, on the face of it, Gary Lineker's tweet looks like a on the face of it, a, a technical breach of that guideline. But I think we've also got our old friend, the grey area here. Uh, um, in other words, no one thinks this is the same as you, you or Hugh Edwards doing it, that it's, this is not like a news presenter basically tearing up uh, the, the impartiality principles inside the kind of news machine. And, and the, the debate, and one of the reasons I think that, 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 that Tim Davey and others in the BBC will want to have a look at that guideline mm -hmm. is in social media public expectations and mm -hmm. practice is changing all the time now and I, what i would i mean to cut to the chase what i would hope is that both gary who is an outstanding broadcaster and the bbc will both despite the kind of crazy noise in in the papers and all the rest of it calmly mm -hmm. take the time to look at whether there is common ground and a way forward of looking at that now Two or three years old but, guideline. But isn't this also, Mark, about a bigger issue, not just about some words in a BBC guideline book. This is also about public perception. And isn't it perhaps the case that actually the BBC has walked into something that has left many people, perhaps many people this morning, watching and thinking, well, hang on a minute, they've taken the side of the government. Isn't there the perception that actually the BBC has bowed to pressure from the Conservatives, not least because of the ongoing saga of the BBC chair and his donations to the Conservative Party. Well, we might come on to that separately. Mm. I think what the BBC's walked into is the 21st century. I mean, if you go across the Atlantic uh, to my most recent uh, main employer, the New York Times, very similar debates about the boundaries of, in quotes, freedom of speech and what's appropriate for a, an organisation which is trying to remain imp independent and impartial. But is it possible so this in is this world? This then? is global. Well, the point is, it's like new behaviours, new public attitudes, new understandable attitudes from individuals, free, uh, e.g. a freelancer like Gary Lineker, and therefore the need to, to think carefully about where to strike the balance. And I think the balance is going to continue to change. So I, I don't believe... I mean, this, this particular incident, in some ways, is a very unhappy kind of accident. Um, Gary Lineker, clearly, I, I, I know Gary well enough to believe in his integrity and his good faith, felt passionately about an issue mm -hmm. and wanted to uh, throw that into the debate. The effect of the tweet, mm -hmm. as we've heard, has been to distract from the actual issue mm -hmm the men, women and children in those boats and all of that. And now it's become an issue about Gary Lineker and the BBC. So it, weirdly, this is not actually, not, not, far from actually kind of influencing that debate, mm. it's actually kidnapped the debate and put it into another unhelpful direction. Do you think, though, that the issue around Richard Sharp, the BBC chair, has made it harder for the BBC to defend what's going on? Would it be better, in your view, if the board said to its chair, which they would have the power to do, not Tim Davey alone, but the board could say, or he could decide to step aside for a while, 
while the inquiry into his yeah. links to Boris Johnson is concluded. And when you say not Tim Davy alone, not Tim Davy at all. At all, it's a, gov at all. It's a government the, I appointment. I mean, it, it, but, what, but it was Boris Johnson better, who appointed uh, Richard Sharp, not, not Tim Davy. Indeed Davey. it was, but in order to help clear up all of this, to help defend that reputation, would it be better for the BBC if the chair, Richard Sharp, with his links to the Conservative Party, were to stand aside until whatever happened between him and Boris Johnson and his finances is cleared up? Would that be better? Well, I think... I, I, what I, again I would say is, hang about. At the moment, there's an independent inquiry going, into, going on into this matter. The leading counsel is, is asking everyone and is going to produce, I, I believe, relatively but soon a report. stand a, aside a, while that report. happens? I, the chairman of the BBC is not an operational executive. I mean, if you go into the, the control room here, you will not see the chairman, the chairman of the BBC giving orders. They look at BBC policy strategically and, and, in, though, and, in, isn't it and in, in, in perspective. Gary Lineker is an active broadcaster for the BBC. Richard Sharp is, 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 is part of a governing body which mm -hmm. doesn't take decisions in real time about actual editorial matters. So I think the most sensible thing, again, is just to calm down, mm. ignore the papers, and let the person who's doing the inquiry complete their inquiry, look at what they say, and then make a decision on the basis of what you know about the facts, rather than just on the fly deciding, oh dear, it's a bit awkward having two of these things running at the same time, let's, let's shoot from the hip. We're almost out of time, but I just want to ask you, yes or no if you can, do you think Gary Lineker will be back on air tonight? I hope so. Do you think that Tim Davey will survive this? I absolutely hope so, and believe so, yeah. OK, Mark Thompson, thank you so much for coming in. It's great to have you here in the studio and back walking through the doors of Broadcasting House. Now, let's hear from our panel, because over there listening to all of that was Peter Salmon, who was a fellow former BBC executive. And Peter, what did you make of what Mark had to say? I mean, he was obviously trying to calm things down, take a breath. But how do you, how do you think that's going to play out? Well, <clears throat> I think Mark's obviously right. He's my former boss, so I'm bound to say this. Well, you've got to say um, the right the, thing. The, a lot of wisdom <laughs> and uh, you know, cool thinking around this project. You're, you're absolutely right. Played out in the heat of real time against you know, one of the biggest political debates of the day, uh, in a 24 hour news cycle, all the rest of it. So, deep breath, think about it. You know, how can each side just pull back a little bit and, and sort of move forward together? I think the issue of, of resolving the issues around the chair are quite complex, mm -hmm. inevitably, because staff feel it. I know from chatting to friends of mine in the organisation that this decision, it doesn't feel like it's... It's not that it impacted this decision, but the staff are looking over their shoulders. They're worried about instability mm -hmm. or they're worried about influence. Mm -hmm. People in the BBC feel that very, as you, as you know, feel mm -hmm. that very intimately. So mm -hmm. I think that's got to be resolved and resolved quite quickly. OK, well, we'll see what happens in the next few days. It's obviously been a fast-moving 48 hours. Now, let's talk about the budget, because the decisions that the Chancellor <coughs> announces in the next 48 hours or so are going to affect each and every single one of us. Um, Nadia, what would you expect and what would you hope to hear from the Chancellor? And I, and I suppose, what are the problems you think he's got to try and fix? What we need from the budget in the first instance, the immediate priority is helping people with the cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. um, that means raising pay, raising benefits, implementing a proper windfall tax on oil and gas giants to cut people's bills. And then we also need ambition for the future. So essentially taxing the rich, introducing wealth taxes and using that money to invest in, in public services, both um, in long-term challenges like the climate crisis and also to ease the cost of living but what we have instead after 13 years of austerity is we've seen our public services crumbling our social security net has been destroyed and now we're going into a cost of living crisis and it seems well we're in a cost of living mm. crisis and it seems that the government is offering more of the same which is basically saying to people i know you're worse off than you were in 2008. Mm. Um, I was 11 in 2008. We, we've already said you're the youngest MP. You don't have to, to, to show off but about how old and winky we all are. But you're not going to get a pay rise. Well, Simon, what do you say to that? Because you're, I mean, I'm, I'm not mm. surprised, I'm already not going to be surprised that you're not exactly on the same page as no, Nadia, well, but I mean, people are suffering, aren't they? Uh, absolutely. And these are difficult times, and there are uh, a wide variety of reasons for that. We know, obviously, the impact of the pandemic, the impact of war in Europe, and the inflationary consequences of, of what Putin has done. The reality is, is that if we want inflation to come down as quickly as possible, uh, then we need to show uh, sensible restraint. That is something which I think is a difficult but, but uh, important truth that we need to uh, 
convey to the public at this time that if we go for inflation-busting pay increases to the, the main public sector unions, as they're demanding, up to 19% in some cases, we will, I'm afraid, make things worse rather than better. Now, some... there's lots we can do mm -hmm. on the positive side of the ledger to make sure that the economy is both stronger uh, and that living standards improve. Uh, and, and growth really is the central challenge, which I think the Chancellor is going to try and address But do you think you're going to get week. the tax cuts that you and some of your colleagues want? Well, I would love to see a reduction in the burden of taxation. We all know that it's at a 70-year high. There are difficult choices around how we address this, but I, I don't think that we can continue to look at all the challenges that this country faces around an ever larger set of demands and say that just dividing the cake ever more finely is going to get us out of trouble. Nana, That's why we've got to keep, really go for growth. You keep talking about difficult choices, but we're not talking about who is making these difficult choices. Through my constituency office door, we're seeing people who haven't had a hot meal in days. I'm supporting a mother at the moment who is um, having to put three pairs of socks on her baby because she can't afford her heating and is, is having to survive on her children's leftovers. What do you say then to, to those people? I, what do you say to a nurse who can't afford to feed her kids? Just, do you yeah. just say, well, you have to put up with it? Because then they'll leave the NHS yeah. and that's fueling the crisis in retention and recruitment. I, I would say we put together a package worth over £37 billion to help with the cost of living, which is something which has meant that every household across this country has received support during the, the crisis. And obviously those who need it the most have received the most. But there are when, £37 billion isn't making a difference to that individual person. Well, it, it, it should be making a difference in every, in every household. Look, we, we all want to see that support go out. But it's not because wages and, and, aren't and, and, going and, up. And, and if we want to and see wages you... grow sustainably, Nadia, then what we need to do is to make sure that we have the most competitive and dynamic economy that we can possibly have. We need to build the homes we need. To make, we need to reform the planning system so that the infrastructure we need can go in. We need to make sure that we are doing things which mean that the UK becomes a better place we to invest because to of a lower tax the regime that we need, than, than other countries. But your, when, your party has scrapped local housing, well, house building targets. And, it, and, and Keir Starmer and was campaigning right in 2021 is... against our planned reforms when Robert Jenrick was the housing secretary. OK, well, you two, after our interviews with the Chancellor and the Shadow Chancellor, will have another <laughs> go at trying to resolve your arguments or enjoying them or reacting to what the Chancellor himself will have to say. But all three of you, thank you very much for now. There's some big questions there because Wednesday is a big day. But no single week alone is responsible for how the country makes its living. So after more than 10 years of the Conservatives in charge, we thought we'd take a look at the big picture. Remember back then? Bruno Mars was number one. To infinity and beyond. We went to infinity and beyond for the third time at the cinema. And this fresh-faced young man had just been made the culture secretary. We want to do things and do things better, but we can only do that if we put the economy back on its feet and particularly restore the nation's finances. Since then, though, on average, the economy's grown only by 1.5% a year. Measly by historical standards, but not bad to compare to other countries. But look what's happened to wages in that time. At the end of 2010, the average take-home pay was just under £600 a week in today's cash. But in December last year, it was 588 So by some measures, average wages are less than 12 years ago. And the average house now costs nearly seven times the average earnings, up from five times back then. And of course, rents now are racing up too, by 12% in the last year. A slightly older Jeremy Hunt, who's now the Chancellor, joins us in the studio. I have to say, looking almost exactly the same, but maybe with a new tie. Um, looking at those statistics, though, do you think life's got harder for people in this country under the Conservatives' time in charge? Well, I'm actually very proud of the fact that, uh, given the challenges we've had, the biggest financial crisis since the Second World War, the energy crisis caused by what's happening in Ukraine, the pandemic, uh, we've actually grown faster than major countries like France, Japan, Italy, and about the same rate as Europe's biggest economy, Germany. Um, and at the same time as doing that, we've managed to bring inequality down. Uh, we've lifted two million households out of absolute poverty after housing costs, including half a million children. So I think we've had some big progress, 
But I don't want to pretend we haven't mm -hmm. had very big challenges. And I think looking forward, mm -hmm. what people want to see is that we have a plan, this is what I want to show on Wednesday in the budget, to make ourselves one of the most prosperous countries in the world. But we can trade statistics all day, but you know very well, given the immediate pressures, but also some of the long-term issues, as we've just seen, many people find it much harder to get on now, particularly the younger generation. And because wealth, so whether investments or things like money in houses, has grown much faster than wages. Is it fair that under more than 10 years of Conservative governments, it is harder for young people to make economic progress, to become prosperous people, if they don't have a big gift from the bank of mum and dad? Well, we do have faced very big challenges in the global economy, but I do believe in a society where you have a safety net. And over the last couple of years, we've given every family in the country an average of three and a half thousand pounds That's to help them question, with their Jeremy, fuel I'm bills. I'm asking about the big picture where in the last decade or so it has become significantly more difficult for young people to buy a home and wages have grown more slowly than wealth. So essentially the haves are having an easier time, the have-nots are having a harder time. But that's where I'm, I'm disagreeing with you Laura because we have been giving help to people who have been struggling and when it comes to young people what they want to see is that we have exciting plans to grow the economy. Let me tell you something else that's happened in the last decade. We have built the third largest technology economy in the world, after, only after America and China. Uh, the largest life science industry in Europe that developed one of the two big COVID vaccines. Uh, Europe's largest film and TV industry. So in terms of areas that are gonna create jobs for young people, uh, give them a, a really exciting future. We've made tremendous progress, on top of which, uh, when it comes to things like climate change, which, which young people care passionately about, we have reduced our emissions by more than any other advanced mm. economy and become a global leader in green industries, in clean energy like offshore wind. So we made a lot of progress, there have been headwinds, but I don't pretend as, as a chancellor that we haven't had to do difficult things in the period mm until the pandemic. We reduced the deficit by 80%, but that was why we could afford the 400 billion pound furlough scheme that meant that even after the pandemic, we've kept unemployment at historically low levels. But let me ask you in a practical sense though, because this is what it means for members of the public. We had an email from one of our viewers, Phil, who's asked, asked us to ask you, what should I say to my hardworking graduate son? He has to live in London for his job. He's never going to be able to afford to buy a home unless I buy it for him. If I help him, how will I afford nursing home fees when I need them? What would your advice be to him? What I would say is that there's no easy fix. If we want to create opportunities uh, for people like Phil, then we have to create the best jobs. We actually have record low youth unemployment. There are more jobs available for young people than we've ever had before. We have to do what it takes to bring down the cost of housing and that's why we've got one of our most capable ministers, Michael Gove, on the case. And we have to show to young people that having weathered these very difficult storms, having uh, grown better than many other major countries, we have a plan for the future. And that's what I'll be talking about on Wednesday. How are we going to overcome problems so that we can give hope for the future to, to young people, now, which is what a Conservative government is all about. Now, one of the things you'll talk about is childcare. We've had lots of emails from viewers on childcare. Uh, Hannah from Oxfordshire says, her partner's paid £20,000 a year. Once they've paid for childcare, they have £100 left over from that salary. The family don't get universal credit. So how are you going to help her this week? Well, I'm a Conservative who believes in the virtue of work and we have more than a million vacancies across the economy at the moment and the, the Brexit decision was a choice not to fill those vacancies with unlimited migration, which I think is the right choice. So on Wednesday you will hear me uh, put together a very comprehensive package of measures to break down the barriers to work. Childcare is one of them and I particularly want to look at the barriers facing the 700,000 uh, parents on low pay, mm -hmm. on universal credit, who aren't able to work, so even though they have exactly a young child. exactly like this family, but they're not on universal credit. How are you going to help them? Will you help them? Or only those on universal credit, the benefit top up, will get help? Well, we would like to help everyone. Mm -hmm. It's expensive to do it. You can't always do everything at once. But what I would say is that 
we can make a, a big difference on childcare. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, by paying people's help for childcare if you are on benefit upfront rather than in arrears. Uh, there's lots we can do, but it isn't just parents, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's also older people wondering whether they should retire early or not. It's uh, people looking for work. We've got one and a half million of those. We could actually fill every single vacancy just from that group. And then it's also the long-term sick and disabled, uh, more than two million people. We should not be a society that forgets those people. They have an enormous contribution to make uh, with the potential to work from home, with Zoom and Teams and all the ways that you can do jobs uh, without actually leaving your house. We can actually revolutionise the opportunities for a group of people who have a real contribution to make. So you'll be a get back to work budget. It might be something that you'll be saying on Wednesday, clearly part of your a central message. But what also other people want in your party, and as we've just heard from your colleague Simon Clark, they think that cutting tax would be the best way to go. And what some Conservative MPs think that your refusal to do so now actually makes things worse. So when are you going to make them happy and cut taxes? Well, I actually agree with Simon. I want a low tax economy. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of over the last decade is that for the first time in history, anyone in this country can earn £1,000 a month and not pay a penny of tax or national but insurance. when are you going to cut taxes? Because that they is, are at record well, levels now. Uh, as I say, we have cut personal taxes. Uh, in the autumn statement, I cut business rates by an average of 10% for every business. Conservatives cut taxes when we, they can, but we also have to be responsible with public finances. It's, it's very important uh, that we remember that businesses need stability, and that means they need to know that we are being careful with the public finances. We're not going to run out of money, as happened under the previous Labour government. But within the bounds of what is responsible, we will always look to reduce the tax burden. So a tip a wink to the autumn, but not this week. Well, um, uh, you know, I think you will see me doing everything we can within the bounds of responsibility. Okay. Um, but what I think you will also see is some hope for the future, because I think we have fantastic opportunities in this country. There is a hard road to follow to get there, but we really can be one of the most prosperous countries in Europe, if not the world. Now, one of the sectors that you've mentioned as providing huge opportunity potentially is tech and science. But in that sector right now, there's a lot of concern over the collapse of a bank in America, the Silicon Valley Bank. Now, that funds a lot of tech companies. We know the Treasury and the Bank of England, you've said publicly already that you will help find a way through the situation. But will you guarantee 100% of the deposits of the companies who stand to lose millions? Well, the first thing I want to say is that the Governor of the Bank of England has said that there is not a systemic risk to the financial system. So people should be reassured by that. Um, there is a serious risk to some of our most promising companies in technology uh, and life sciences. Uh, the Prime Minister, I, the Governor of the Bank of England, were up late last night. We've been working through the weekend mm. uh, to come up with a solution. Uh, we want to find a way that uh, minimises, or if we possibly can, avoids all losses to those incredibly promising countries. What we will do is mm. bring forward very quickly a plan to make sure that they can meet but their will, operational will, cash flow but requirements. But will that plan mean 100 percent guarantee of their deposits? Well, you'll have to wait money? to see the whole plan. But okay. what we will do is bring forward a plan to make sure they can pay their staff. That's the big ask we've Absolutely. had in I the mean, last and, 24 hours. And, and I'd hours. like to, to read to you and share with our viewers what one source involved in the discussions told me this morning. They said it all feels like it could be pretty terminal for UK tech. The Prime Minister is going big guns about creating a great place for innovation, but this Monday at least 200 firms employing thousands of people will find they can't pay their staff or suppliers because they bank, the bank they had an account with has gone bust. Our, invest, our investors estimate 30 to 40 percent of UK startups could be affected. Now, I know the Bank of England governor says that's not a systemic risk, but that is a very real situation for those businesses and those workers. So I ask you again, will you guarantee 100% well, of their deposits? 
you're going to have to wait and hear what the solution is, but that risk is precisely why the Prime Minister and I have been working at pace over the weekend to make sure that we have a solution. These are very, very important companies to and the UK, a very, very morning? important part of our future. Well, what I can say now, because we're still working through all the different solutions, is that we will have a plan that deals with their operational cash flow needs in the next few days because we recognise that is important but we need to find a longer term solution um, because uh, although this is a bank most people won't have heard of yeah. it happens to be one that's used by some of our most important companies. Okay let's talk and you knew this was going to come about Gary Lineker and the BBC. It's a big bust up between the BBC and one of its highest paid stars but it is also for some Conservative MPs, something that has really got them riled. Now, in your view, should Gary Linker, Linker be presenting Match of the Day tonight? Well, I don't think it's for me to say, and let me tell you why. It's because um, what matters, and I think what's come out of this, is the reason that we love the BBC, it's an incredibly important national institution, is because it's trusted for its independence and its impartiality. So I've got absolutely no idea which political party you voted for at the last election, and, and that is right. Um, and what needs to happen as a result of not just the discussions about Gary Lineker, but also about the chairman of the BBC following uh, the independent investigation that's now happening, is that we need to make sure we maintain that trust in the independence and the impartiality of the BBC. Now, I'm one of the people that the BBC scrutinises on behalf of the public. So it obviously isn't for me to say how the BBC does that, but it's very important it does. But do you think that this row about Gary Lineker, and I note there you mentioned Richard Sharp, the chairman of the BBC's links to the Conservative Party, do you believe those two things have called into question the impartiality of the BBC? Well, I don't want to say anything other than making sure the BBC maintains its reputation for independence and impartiality is the outcome that matters most. Now, I can disagree with Gary Lineker on, on small boats, as I do profoundly, um, but what really matters in all of this is that when you're interviewing me, people know that you're doing it on behalf of the public and not with a political motive, by the way, which I don't think you have at all. But that is the thing that needs to be protected. But when it comes to Gary Lineker, though, some of your colleagues get so exercised by what is essentially a sports presenter who is not saying what he said online, on air. Why does it matter so much to people? Well, we are a, a robust uh, democracy. Um, and uh, if someone says something you disagree with, then MPs do what they can't do in, in Russia or China. They speak up and they say, I disagree with what that person said. Um, but what matters behind this is, is, is something much more important, which is the way one of our most important national institutions works. And I think that's what we need to protect. Briefly, I just want to ask you a, a different aspect of this um, affair. This has been a conversation that began around the government's plans for immigration and asylum seekers. Some of your colleagues are concerned that under this legislation, children might be detained. Now that was banned under David Cameron, under the coalition government that you were part of. Does that ban stand or could children be detained under this new legislation? Well, um, we are making special arrangements for children as uh, the Home Secretary outlined. But can I just, I want to make this point, uh, Laura. I am incredibly proud that under a Conservative government, we have had hundreds of thousands of families opening their doors to Ukrainians. Uh, we have given uh, a bigger welcome to people from Hong Kong than nearly anywhere in the world, as well as doing an enormous amount for people from Afghanistan and Syria. And, and that people, public, many people are very, yeah, very welcoming, know, but, but this is that a public point. consent for legal migration depends on dealing with the unfairness of illegal migration. And that is why I think it is so important that we tackle this issue head but on. But you said there'll be special arraignment, arrangements for children. Does that mean you are ruling out a return to detaining refugee children? Are you ruling that out? Well, the Home Secretary has made clear that we are going to treat children differently under these arrangements. And I think you'll have to talk to her about precisely how that happens. OK, Jeremy Hunt, Chancellor, thank you very much indeed for coming in. I know it's a busy weekend with that banking situation and also with your budget on Wednesday. Thanks very much for being here.
So pressure on the purse strings and pressure politically too, not least from his rival, Rachel Reeves, Labour's shadow chancellor. Now she is one of the closest allies of Keir Starmer and she has been painstakingly trying to build the party's financial credibility and reset Labour's relationship with business. We've heard too she's been come rather well known in the city where she's been making lots of contacts and working very hard and she's here back in the studio. Good morning to you, Rachel. Good morning. Now let's start with the BBC. Um, and then we will talk about the budget at length. Um, your leader has said the BBC has not acted impartially, but the other day Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, said that Gary Lineker's comments were, were wrong. Now, it's not very credible, is it, to have changed your mind like that? Well, whether you agree with Gary Lineker's tweet or not, and I wouldn't have used that language, I think that it is perfectly reasonable that he can present the football commentary on the BBC um, at a weekend. And look, last time I came on this programme, Laura, we also started with the BBC. On the 22nd of January, I was sitting in this chair when the revelations came out about Richard Sharp. Richard Sharp, the chairman of the BBC, donated £400,000 to the Conservative Party, helped facilitate an £800,000 loan to the former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. He is still in his job. Gary Lineker isn't able to present the football commentary. I think there is a sense of proportionality here. The Tories have obviously put a huge amount of pressure on the government to get rid of Gary Lineker. I don't remember those same Tory MPs crying about impartiality when those revelations about Richard Sharp came out. No, Richard Sharp has said publicly that he didn't do anything wrong and there is an investigation going on into that. But do you think that the BBC and the Director General, Tim Davies' reputation has been damaged by how this has been handled? Well, the BBC have clearly come under immense pressure from the Conservative Party to take Gary Lineker off air. Do you know because that they beyond didn't... what backbenchers have said publicly? I mean, do you well, have evidence for that? Just look at these letters, these tweets. Tory MPs are talking more about Gary Lineker than they are about the cost of living crisis, seven million pa people waiting for NHS uh, treatment, uh, the crisis um, in terms of, uh, of securing our borders and treating refugees with uh, dignity, talking more about Gary Lineker than any of those things that matter on a day-to-day -day basis for our constituency. So under huge pressure, I think it is a shame that the BBC has bowed to that pressure. And I would urge the BBC to reconsider this decision because I think it has now gone totally out of proportion. OK, well, let's see what happens in the next couple of days. Let's talk then about things that are very important to our viewers and to your constituents and what's happening in the economy. Now, you've said this weekend that you would like Labour to follow something of Joe Biden's example, the American president who has put in billions and billions and billions of dollars into the economy. You want to put about more than 28 billion in a year to support the economy going green. Now, can you explain what that money would actually be for and how you'd spend it? Well, there's clearly a huge imperative to get our economy growing. You set that out earlier in the programme, Laura. I see around the country, when I visit businesses in all parts of the UK, huge potential and huge ambition. But it is obvious in the growth, the investment, the productivity numbers, that that potential is not being realised today. And so I do take inspiration from what President Biden is doing in the United States. He's turning the rust belt into an electric vehicle belt, creating good manufacturing jobs in former industrialised heartlands and getting businesses to invest in the UK, in the US. I want to see some of that action here in the UK. At the moment, Laura, it feels like we are in the changing room when other countries are in the global race and we're going to miss out, miss out on that investment in carbon capture and storage, floating offshore wind, green steel, green hydrogen. Some country in the world is going to be the global leader in these future, in the jobs of the future. Why not Britain? We have so much going for us, apart from a government that is prioritising these investments. But you're talking about £28 billion a year, which if you top that up over the lifetime of a parliament, I mean, it's about £140 billion. And I think to a lot of viewers this morning, that might sound like not just a lot of money, but a, a scary amount of state intervention. You know, that would be a big change in the economy. Should Whitehall... Or if you're sitting in number 11 Downing Street, should we really be trying to pick winners in industry like that? Well, the, the point is that other countries, the US, Australia, the European uh, um, economies, in Asia as well, 
are taking a punt on these jobs and industries of the future. And the real risk here, Laura, is that in 10 years time, we're going to be importing electric vehicles because we failed to produce the batteries here. We're going to be importing steel because we failed to turn our steel industry to, um, to green steel. We're going to be importing hydrogen and electricity because we failed at this moment to seize those opportunities. So the question is, what happens if we don't do this? The big risk is that we let other countries uh, steal a march on us here in Britain and miss out on those opportunities and see those low growth numbers become bedded in. But, but here's a, let me just give you one statistic. If we carry on on the route that we are going at the moment with our growth rates, the average family in Poland is going to be better off than the average family in Britain by 2030. I'm determined that that is not the case, but it does require action and it does require some urgency. But some economists, and I know you were an economist by trade at the Bank of England before you became a politician, some economists and some politicians look at this, they look at what's happened in the US and that kind of intervention and they go, hang on a minute, that's going to take us back to some kind of era of protectionism when governments were looking after their own and this could somehow lead to the end of proper free trade. Well, who's going to look after our jobs and industries if it's not the British government? And, you know, I know that Grant Shapps, the Energy Secretary, said that what the US is doing is dangerous. I tell you what is dangerous is sitting on our hands whilst other countries are acting. And I am determined that for Britain, we take advantage of our opportunities. Our industrial here. heritage, our geography, our great universities means that we have every chance of succeeding, but, but not on the path we're but, on at the moment. But there's a tension here here though isn't there because many times we've discussed your plans for the economy and you've been at pains to say if you're a chancellor you will watch every single penny very very carefully there will be no huge opening of the checkbook willy-nilly you will have an ironclad fist I think you once said on the public finances and then yet here you are putting forward a plan for tens and tens and tens of billions of pounds of subsidy. Now, doesn't that pull in the opposite direction? People are, might be confused about let where me, you're really coming from. But let me answer that question directly. I've set out a set of fiscal rules that an incoming Labour government would abide by. We'd get a grip of day-to-day -day spending, bring debt down as a share of our national economy, and then subject to that, invest in these huge opportunities and we would make these investments our priority is why it's so important to get a grip of the day-to-day -day spending especially some of the wasteful spending that we've seen from this government because if we do that we'll have the money for these investments but these investments would be not uh, crowding out business investment it would be investing alongside business to get these industries um, off the ground and the office of budget responsibility of course monitor the public finances have said this that if we delay by a decade the actions needed to get to net zero it doubles the cost so a responsible chancellor needs to know when to say no and i'm absolutely fine to say no to spending requests but they also know when you need to invest prudently alongside business to take advantage of the opportunities so that we can get out of this low growth, low productivity, low investment spiral that under the Tories Britain is in. But in just in terms of how these subsidies would work, I think people will be wondering this morning, are you actually talking about the government employing people, the government spending money on building things, like actually how would this kind of scale of subsidy work? Because it is huge I don't think what you're of this promising. As, uh, um, as a subsidy, it's about investing alongside business. Well, what so does you that take, mean though in well, practical let me, terms? Let me tell you. So if you take carbon capture and storage, uh, companies like uh, Drax uh, want to invest and are investing in carbon capture and storage, but you need government to invest alongside business uh, to create that capacity for storing the carbon in the North Sea. If you take hydrogen, it is a, a new technology. Green hydrogen is a new technology. No country is doing this at scale. You need a partnership between universities, government and business to get this off the ground. I am being guided here by what businesses are telling me about the opportunities, but also that this requires a partnership approach. So it's about governments, like other governments are doing around the world, investing alongside business to see 
seize some of these opportunities. And under our plans for a national wealth fund, a national wealth fund is something that 70 countries around the world have, from Norway to Singapore to France. So invest as part of that national wealth fund in those gigafactories, uh, in green steel, in green hydrogen, in renewable ready ports, with business, alongside business, because that's what they are calling and crying out for right now. Now, let's talk about one business that's having a huge effect on having gone under, the Silicon Valley Bank we yeah. talked about with the Chancellor. Now, as we've heard, there are many firms in this country. It's not you know, a bank that we'll all have heard of, but there are many tech firms in particular who are worried now about what's going to happen when they open tomorrow morning because they're worried about losing their money. Would you push for the government to guarantee 100% of the money that those firms have with that bank? Well, first of all, I understand why businesses are so concerned. I did a piece of work last year on how to make Britain the best place to start and grow a business. And one of the things that we said in that report is that the capital is too often available in the US mm -hmm. and not in the UK. And this is a wake up call that we have been over reliant for that foreign capital for investment in British so would startups. Would you guarantee the cash for those firms? Well, look, we need to uh, understand the full exposure of British businesses. But when the Chancellor said a moment ago to you, Laura, that we'll find out in the next few days what the government's intentions are, that really worries me and I know will really worry start-up businesses because tomorrow morning they're going to have uh, calls on them, whether that is wages, whether that is uh, suppliers, um, whether that is their share prices or their investors mm -hmm. saying we no longer have confidence. So specific. we need tomorrow morning mm -hmm. to hear from the government how they are going to protect, whether that is, is guaranteed, whether that is working with the US government on a rescue for Silicon Valley Bank. There are different answers to this problem, but we cannot let the British startup uh, community pay the price for this bank failure because it will be the British economy then that ultimately pays the price. Okay, we're, I, we just want to close with some quick fire questions for you from our viewers. So if we can do them, we'll get through a, get through a few. Um, one of our viewers, Keith, wants to know, would the Labour Party commit to keeping the triple lock forever? No, that's the guarantee for future state pensions, if you want to We've made it. a commitment to stick with the triple for, lock. For, that, that is true. Would you commit to wages going up in real times if you win the election? Sorry, in real terms if you win the election? Would there be wages be higher at the end of five years if Labour wins an election? Well, you showed the statistics earlier that after 13 years, wages are lower now. Our plans to have the highest sustained growth with higher living standards in all parts of the country are absolutely about getting that investment and productivity to ensure that people's living standards are higher. That is our ambition. That is what we aim to do. And would you promise that more people would own their home by the end of the first parliament? We've made a commitment to increase home ownership, and that includes building new homes. The House Builder Federation say that the number of new homes built next year is likely to be the lowest in 70 years. We need to bring back those planning targets for local authorities so that young people can have their hope and their future back with a chance of home ownership. Okay, Rachel Reeves, it's always great to have you in the studio. I know it's a busy week, the budget coming, but thank you very much nice indeed for coming you, in and asking questions on such a, answering questions or on such a range of issues. Now, before we see what the panel think, of course, you know we love hearing what you think. We do ask your questions if you email them in, you can do that, kunzberg at bbc.co.uk, or if you're social media inclined, you can use the hashtag BBC Laura K. Now, Simon Clark, first of all, let's think of what Jeremy Hunt, you're not getting your tax cuts anytime soon. Well, I would love to see uh, tax cuts. I think that reducing our corporation tax rate rather than raising it will be the right thing to do. And well, we saw, do it, we saw, we saw AstraZeneca you. make a decision to choose the Republic of Ireland over... over, over no, no, if you look at the results of lowering corporation tax in the 2010s, we got more revenue in, we got We've more investment in. we got the lowest in. corporation tax in the G7. We, we need to have lower corporation tax rather than higher. And we still would have the lowest, even, even with an increase. And it, we've literally seen AstraZeneca choose the Republic over us. Their corporation tax rate is 12 and percent ours is set to be 25 percent i don't want to see that there Except was stuff that, that i welcome, has a valid course. point doesn't she you were part of liz Truss's government and when she she promised tax cuts without saying how she would pay for them it was a meltdown now what jeremy hunt said mm. is that well he'd love to give you tax cuts but not if you can't pay for them well, it's very important clearly that you do show how you will pay for tax cuts i think it's very important that you don't underestimate the dynamic effects of lower taxes that is to say that lower taxes do stimulate growth and that you you can't 
underestimate that size of the ledger. We have extremely low growth. We, we also have extremely high taxes, and that's why we have that extremely low and growth. And yet the, but the, the, the reality are being taxed. The, 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 because if, under, the richest under people Liz are paying Truss's more government. tax, Nadia, than they were when Labour were in office. Income taxes are for, uh, paid, paid as a proportion by the top 1% are actually higher today than there they were, were under Gordon Brown. There are things that the government could do, like, for example, equalising capital gains tax and income tax that would generate, that would be over £15 billion. Um, uh, a one to two percent tax on assets the, over ten million that would be twenty three the, these billion. Are, these are the taxes which deter and instead, investment and enterprise. What we need to do as an economy is focus on the things which are really holding us back. Mm -hmm. So we do need to take on the NIMBYs. We need to actually address seri serious planning reform. Mm -hmm. I welcome what the Chancellor said about childcare, and I think that's a really important step forward because I think we all agree that childcare in this country is just mm -hmm. too expensive. Mm -hmm. Paying. Uh, universal credit recipients in advance rather than in arrears will be a really good step forward. Okay. But I'd like to see tax cuts, frankly, for working families. Okay, and Peter, I mean, you are now an executive at a big creative media company. I mean, what do you think of what we're hearing from our politicians at the moment about the economy? Is the UK a good place to do business? I, I think we. I, I, what we'd like to see is a caring, fairer, better shared out use of resources and investment in the UK, so we can our workforce can you know work well, work from anywhere in the UK. They possibly can. There's an irony, I think, that Gary and the other Match of the Day presenters are not presenting from Salford, from Greater Manchester today. Mm. It was a place that we moved, you know, we've moved half the workforce in the BBC across the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, investment, jobs, mm -hmm. the economy, the media economy, all the rest of it. I'm not sure we'd do that now with the chaos, I think, in the transport system, in infrastructure. So the message is around HS2. Mm -hmm around the lack of investment, around capital projects, all the rest of it, I think it's hitting confidence. That's and I, I think we need that back. OK, all three of you, thank you very much for now. Uh, we've had an email from Susan Woods who says, surely the more important question is why any licence payers funding is goes to such an enormous salary for Gary Lineker. Maybe it would be good to let him go. And in a similar vein, Jim, who calls himself the white van man, says, me and my boys would do his job for 10% of the fee <laughs> and we'd keep our thoughts to ourselves. There you go. It's always great to hear from you. Now, you know, though, we never let you go without a bit of something to cheer, as well as the controversies. It is the Oscars tonight. And whoever wins, one of the most amazing stories is actually how one of the movies got made. The World War I novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, was adapted by the Scottish writer and champion triathlete Leslie Patterson. But it only made it into a film after 16 years of hard work. She cleaned up at the BAFTAs and she's heading again to the red carpet tonight. I talked to her from the gym in LA, as you do, before her four hour getting ready session for the awards tonight. And I asked her what's on her mind as she heads off to the Oscars. Completely nerve wracking, very surreal. Yeah, I don't quite know what's happening. I think it's all going to hit me when I start getting in amongst the red carpet and all that nonsense. This film's had astonishing success now, but it took you 16 years to get here. Tell us about your journey. Myself and my writing partner at the time, Ian Sokal, uh, we optioned the book 16 years ago. And, you know, it took us a couple of years to adapt, of course, because it's an incredibly difficult novel. Um, and then we went on this crazy journey to try and get it off the ground. Different producers, different finance, different actors, the whole kit and caboodle. And, uh, yeah, here they are. And, Leslie, you read the book, All Quiet on the Western Front, at school, and then it stayed with you for so many years, including during your successful career as a triathlete. So you know a thing or two about endurance, don't you? Yeah, and pain and suffering, that's for sure. I think it's one of those things that it, it just stays in your soul. It's like that fire in the belly. And, you know, ultimately the triathlon training for me, it just kind of stabilised me in many ways because it's so arbitrary uh, whether or not you get a film off the ground. Uh, at least in sport, you know, you, you say you're going to go run 10 miles, you run 10 miles and you tick that nice little box. Uh, so it was a very definitive thing for me to kind of wrestle around what was not happening in film. I hope to kind of lead by example and inspire people to keep going. And you won at the BAFTAs. Do you think you'll win tonight? There's so much love for the film. Maybe, maybe we could be the dark horse that runs away with it. So fingers, toes, everyone cross. If you do, we hope you don't get cut off like you were during your speech at the BAFTAs. If we get 45 seconds, that's it. And there's three of us. So really, you can't say much before the old music starts playing. So we'll see if, see if I get even a sentence. And after all of this success, what are you working on next? 
we have a great project, a psychological thriller set in the Highlands of Scotland in Glencoe. Uh, so I can't wait to do my, my wee run over the mountain and then get on set. I think that would be my perfect day. Um, but we also have a really amazing historical epic set in Ghana in 1900 that I'm secretly hoping to get Idris Elba uh, on board for. So we'll, we'll see if that pans out. His mother's from Ghana, so I think it would be the perfect fit. Wow, you never know. Maybe Idris will be watching this morning. Um, all you three, any tips for the Oscars tonight, Nadia? Oh, um, well, I'll be crossing everything for Leslie tonight. Um, I would say pick a hype song before your speech. Oh, I classic. Just, I've got a great playlist. <laughs> <laughs> Gigs Talking the Hardest is my favourite. There we go. Peter, any I, tips for tonight? I think Leslie Patterson's extraordinary. It just shows how an individual can make a difference. She's astonishing. So good luck to Leslie and the team. Simon? It's an amazing film. Uh, I yeah. watched it and it's not one that uh, leaves you quickly. It's, uh, I, I'd recommend it to anybody. Uh, well, let's see what happens with all the gongs tonight. All three of you, thank you so much for being with us. It's been great having you with us and also hearing from the force of nature that is Leslie Patterson. And whether you've been wearing Hollywood sequins or your gym gear or you're still in your jammies, thank you so much for watching. What a morning when the BBC is stuck in a skirmish with its highest paid star over his view on the government's plans for immigration. Whether you have picked a side, it is a mess. And again, politicians have jumped into a row about something that's happened on social media, while both parties are jockeying to find convincing solutions for the serious long-term problems in our economy. In the next few days, that list of priorities might shift around a bit. My friend Joe Coburn will have the budget live on BBC Two and BBC News on Wednesday, so join her then, and I will see you next Sunday or on the iPlayer. Goodbye till then.